Good morning. Um, today is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Eduardo Galeano Riveras, who is a uh, my former colleague, uh, our professor, former professor at uh, the Department of Physical Arrangement University and the uh, last chairman of our department, and uh, who is currently. Uh, <clears throat> And faculty at, uh, at McMaster. So let me just introduce a little bit some, uh, uh, give me some information about Eduardo. So uh, Eduardo has his um, undergraduate degree from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic in 83, uh, followed by a master degree in 87 uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison. And then he got his PhD in medical physics at the University of Texas. Anderson uh, Cancer Center. So Eduardo is a specialist in, in medical physics. So, and um, he was a uh, faculty at Laurentian from 2003 to basically uh, last year. And he was, like I said, the last chairman of our department uh, on the more professional uh, side and, and his, uh, uh, professional research and, and teaching activities. So he was um, um, chair of uh, medical division of CAP in 2013-14. Uh, um, um, Eduardo is a co-author of a uh, first year textbook on physics, which is called Physics for Life Sciences. Uh, this is the textbook adopted for the first year uh, course in more than uh, 15 universities, Canadian and, and the States, I believe. And uh, uh, it's been sold by over uh, 30,000 copies up to date. Uh, and um, Eduardo was always uh, uh, more concentrated on the, the teaching stream. So he developed many courses, few courses in uh, biological sciences and medical physics. Um, he developed uh, radi uh, radiation therapy program, medical biophysics undergraduate program, programs at Laurentian. Uh, he was a recipient of uh, Laurentian University of Science and Engineering Teaching Excellence Award. He published uh, over 30, 35 uh, review, uh, uh, peer reviewed papers, and uh, he supervised uh, quite a, a lot of undergraduate and uh, eight graduate students. Uh, and we, like, just on a personal touch, we, uh, we know each other since. Uh, 2004, when I came to Laurentian, and uh, uh, we we had offices <laughs> next to each other. So, and he will tell us today why we don't have <laughs> offices next to each other <laughs> these days. And uh, I guess at this point, I will leave uh, the uh, possibility to talk. Thank you, Gennady. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Was that me you were talking about? I, okay, I didn't recognize that. Thank you very much. So uh, let me, uh, is the sound okay? Am I coming through okay? Thank you. So apologies, uh, my French is very limited, so I will necessarily have to do this in English. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, and let me start by thanking Professor Tremblay who uh, invited me here today on behalf of the uh, Quantum Institute and uh, the University of Sherbrooke. So uh, this is not going to be an ordinary physics talk, although I will have one equation. Um, uh, it's uh, related to what happens in physics, but it will be of a slightly different nature. It will be, uh, and I will go over um, an event, uh, a, a very painful event that occurred last year uh, at Laurentian University in Sudbury. So with that, let me uh, go to my first slide. What do, why, what, what am I going to attempt to do here today? Well, I, I, I hope that in the next 50 minutes or so, I can at least partially attempt to do three things. Number one, I'd like to give you a flavor for some of the legal aspects and implications of what happened there uh, a year ago. Um, number two, I want to give you some financial background on what took us there 
And number three, most importantly, I'd like to convey to you a flavor for the, <clears throat> the human costs and the pain associated with what happened there. So with those three things in mind, uh, let us uh, get right into it. So the first question that you might legitimately ask, and I, I think we all ask ourselves this when we ask someone to uh, give us uh, an hour of their time, is why, why would you be interested in listening to this talk? Well, let me, let me try to argue why this might result of some interest to you. Uh, number one, because if it happened to us at Laurentian University, do not think for a moment that you have some sort of magic shield where it couldn't happen elsewhere. Um, at this point, it's not just a theoretical issue. There is now legal precedent for what happened. And so therefore, if it happened once, it can certainly repeat itself. Um, <clears throat> now, the consequences of when something like this happens are so vast, so great, so uh, cataclysmic that even the remote possibility of having it happen is something that should command at least some attention. Um, in fact, I am informed that approximately some 30 years ago, you had a somewhat similar problem here in the province in which the provincial university system was approximately $400 million in the hole with no way of getting out of it. And the province had to jump in and bail the system out. Uh, unfortunately, that is not what happened to us in Ontario uh, a year ago. So in fact, it actually happened here. And at the very end, I'll go over and show you that it happened again right here in the province of Quebec, in fact, right here in Sherbrooke, at the city of Sherbrooke. So the next very legitimate question that you might ask is, well, why listen to this clown? Why should he be giving this talk? And of course, I have no special answer to that. I have no, uh, no special credentials of any sort, but let me just point out two or three facts. Um, number one, I was one of 111 full-time tenured faculty members who were terminated. Um, number two, I also happened fortuitously or circumstantially to be serving as chairman of one of the departments that were completely eliminated, in this case, uh, the physics department. So in total, we had... Uh, eight departments eliminated two of those in, in sciences, physics and math. Uh, number three, and this gets very personal, uh, my own son's program was eliminated. He was attending Laurentian University. And so like approximately 3,000 other students, he had to go and look for another university. So all of this happened to me in a 15-minute Zoom meeting on April the 12th, 2021. I don't know if those are special credentials or not, probably not, but at least I will claim that I can bring some perspective to the problem. And so with that, let's go to our next slide. Now, to the case itself, let me just basically outline uh, what happened there from a legal point of view. So on February the 1st, 2021, uh, administrators on behalf of the university filed for what is called, well, for court protection, insolvency uh, protection in Ontario Superior Court, which is basically, for the lack of a better name, a federal court. Um, and uh, this was allowed by the court, and it marked the first and still only time in uh, the annals of Canadian academ uh, academia that a publicly funded, not-for-profit, post-secondary educational institution availed itself of the provisions of the so-called Companies Creditors Arrangement Act. It's a federal act. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, the action resulted in part from accumulating successive operating deficits, which were effectively unknown to staff, faculty, alumni, benefactors, uh, regulating authorities, provincial authorities, 
uh, and or the public at large, as we will see in a moment. Um, so more specifically, on April the 12th, uh, so we fast forward, filing was done February the 1st, approximately uh, two and a half months later, on, on April the 12th, the university announced the uh, <clears throat> under court protection under these uh, the provisions of, of this protection, the elimination of 69 programs, 111 uh, full time faculty out of a full complement of approximately 320. So do the math. That's about a third of the faculty wiped out that day. Um, and I'll get into the numbers a little bit later of these approximately 87 as best I can reconstruct were tenured faculty. Um, and in addition to that, uh, you had uh, 78 other terminations, 55 were staff, so unionized staff, and approximately 23 mid-level administrators were also terminated. Now, what is the CCA, CCAA, the Companies Creditors Arrangement Act? It is an act of Congress, or sorry, an act of parliament passed in 1939 with the, in the middle of the depression, with the intent of avoiding the dominoes of liquidations of companies that was going on in that period of time. So the idea was that instead of liquidating a company, the courts could bring creditor, insolvent companies, the courts could bring creditors and companies or debtors together to seek an arrangement. The idea was fundamentally to preserve the viability of profit-making corporations. Secondary to that was the preservation of jobs. Tertiary to that was trying to maximize recovery for creditors who were owed money. So this goes back to 1939, uh, almost uh, 80 or so years. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let me just point out that the framers of the act never envisioned it to be utilized by a post-secondary, nonprofit, publicly funded educational institution. They called it Companies Creditors Arrangement Act for a reason. They did not call it Universities Creditors Arrangement Act. Uh, in spite of that, the courts did accept this filing. And uh, let me just give you a brief timeline. It can get confusing, so stay with me on this. So um, <clears throat> on December the 10th of 2020, the university uh, goes to the province, hat in hand, and say, okay, we got a problem. We've got an imminent liquidity problem here. Um, we need a bailout of approximately $100 million. Uh, 10 days later, 11 days later, on 21st of December, 2020, the province responds, giving the university two choices. Choice number one, you get the $100 million, we bail you out on condition that we bring our accountants, you open up the books. Option number two is we give you right now $12 million, that'll keep you going until the end of March, we'll sit down then and see where we go. Um, a few days later in January, the university administration uh, informed uh, Queens Park, the, the provincial government, that they were rejecting both options and that they were going to proceed with filing under CCAA, which in fact they did February 1st, 2021. Um, <clears throat> now, fast forward, and we'll go over this. Uh, this has resulted uh, at this time in approximately $361 million in court approved debt that's now being negotiated from approximately 1,500 different creditors. So uh, now, uh, fast forward, that was uh, February of 21. Fast forward to April of 21, so April the 12th, the university announced those terminations. Uh, shortly thereafter, in the month of April, uh, later in April, there, uh, the, uh, the 
provincial parliament instructed the auditor general to audit Laurentian's finances. Uh, the administration refused to turn over documents to the, uh, the auditor general. Uh, and at that point, the Ontario legislature, so parliament, reacted by issuing what is called a bench warrant. So the third time in the history of Ontario parliament that such a, um, an order was issued. What is a bench warrant? In simple terms, it's basically an arrest warrant waiting to happen. In other words, when there's a bench warrant, if you do not comply with those terms, you are going to jail. And so that was issued, and as a consequence of that, uh, parallel to that, on the, on the uh, judicial branch, the court process was, was going on, uh, the presiding judge decided that, well, Laurentian should turn over most documents to the Auditor General, save a few which were considered too sensitive or too damaging. So we fast forward a bit, um, and now it's a year later, um, and uh, we're now in uh, March, so that was just last month. Uh, the administration finally allowed, uh, announced after a uh, give and take uh, that it would comply with the speaker's warrant. Now, of course, had it not complied with it, both the president of the university and the chairman of the board of governors were going to jail. And at that point, they kind of thought about it a little bit better and said, yeah, you know, this is maybe not a good idea. So you can see right here, uh, they decided to uh, turn over approximately 3 million documents, basically the totality of, of the documents. Uh, and now for the first time, as I estimated and others, the university was actually being treated not by the courts, but by parliament as the corporation that it was trying to be. In other words, if you're going to mess around, you're going to be held accountable. The CEO is going to be held accountable to the stockholders, in this case, taxpayers. Okay. Um, in effect, there was somewhat of a tussle there between the legislative and the judicial branch of government, if you will. Okay, so it, it let's, so that's sort of where we are. Let's look a little bit at how we got there. So when you look at this thing, um, <clears throat> in essence, there are five independent factors that, uh, that got us where we are. Uh, and let me talk about the first three. They are factors which I classify as factors of either mismanagement, if you're going to be politically correct, or outright incompetent, incompetence, if you're going to be somewhat honest. And the first one of those is embarking on a construction spree, a semi-wild construction spree that started, uh, that went for about 10 years from roughly speaking 2010 to 2020, 2019, just before COVID hit. So I'm not going to go over the specifics, but uh, you've got an engineering center here, you've got a school of architecture there, you've got a, a student center here, et cetera. When you add all of it up, $137 million, give or take. Okay. The idea was, we'll, get, we'll go over this in more detail, the idea was what don't we have that the schools in southern Ontario, because if you know anything about the geography of Ontario, Sudbury is 450 kilometers north of, uh, of Toronto, so we're considered northern Ontario. What don't we have that they have down? Well, for one, buildings. All right, let's put up some buildings and the students will come. So $137 million of buildings were put up. Actually, not as crazy of an idea as it sounds at the time. It, it actually even kind of made sense. Uh, but I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Um, number two, the other thing that the university thought was this. Well, if you can't bring the students to the buildings, 
why not do the other obvious thing? Bring the buildings to the students. It's a lot easier to pack a building up and, and bring it down to Southern Ontario, right? Well, you can't do that. But you can do the next best thing, and that is buy an existing campus. And so basically the university, Laurentian University, took over parts of an existing college in the, the city of Barrie. If anyone knows where Barrie is, it's basically uh, a suburb of Toronto these days. It's an hour north of Toronto, and there was an existing college there called Georgian College. Well, they basically took over parts of Georgian College and, uh, and decided that this was a good strategy to compete. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, by the time we got out of that mess uh, in 2015, uh, about 50 or $12 million were, were spent. Number three, the 2018 Saudi student diplomatic incident. So everyone will remember, I don't know how it was here in, in the province of Quebec, but certainly it hit us pretty badly at Laurentian University. So basically, in essence, there was a diplomatic row between the governments of Saudi Arabia and Canada. And as a result of that, uh, many, if not most, of Saudi students were withdrawn from Canadian universities. Well, it turns out that uh, at Laurentian, we had an over-dependence on Saudi students. And uh, that ended up costing somewhere around uh, $10 million or so. so uh, and I do classify this as mismanagement incompetence, and, uh, and you'll see why I classify it that way. Now, then there are two factors which are what I classify as everyone else factors. Okay, uh, Why? Because they affected not just Laurentian University, but many other universities, quite frankly. So the first one is the 2019 10% tuition cut by the conservative government all across Ontario universities and colleges. So 22 universities, 24 colleges, including Laurentian got hit with this. And sure, when you add up the numbers, uh, the hit that we took was of order three to $4 million with that. And finally, I don't need to tell you about this, but there's this pesky issue of COVID and how it affected everyone. And to this day, we're all, wearing masks, we're still feeling it two, year, two years later. So certainly it affected Laurentian as well. And a quick estimate is that total losses due to COVID attributable directly to COVID, eh, about $4 million, give or take, depending on who's doing the numbers, okay? Um, so these are the five factors that when combined as sort of in linearly independent vectors in R5, when you combine them, they took us where we find ourselves today. There may have been other second order terms, but these are certainly the linear terms in the equation. Now, I just point out that um, uh, on May the 10th uh, of last year, uh, in, a, in a very public letter, the chairman of the Board of Governors and the previous president for the last 10 years, who basically presided over the university during this whole period pre-COVID, uh, they uh, penned an open letter in which, incredibly, they blamed what happened on the everyone else factors. In other words, COVID, the tuition cuts, and the Saudi withdrawal. So they admitted no blame. They admitted uh, no responsibility. So this is an open letter. You can uh, Google it and you'll see. So let's take each one of these factors separately and, and, and let's, let's take our microscope out or our, our magnifying glasses out. So here you have a plot of uh, student enrollment as a function of time for the years that we're talking about, 2012 to approximately 2020. So the blue bars, the histograms there uh, denote enrollment. You will and the, ignore the red bar. That's just faculty complement. So it, a first order glance at this shows you that the enrollment numbers were fairly flat. So at that point, you certainly have to be able to look back and say, okay, 
how's that building spree thing coming along? Are we actually registering the explosive growth in enrollment that this was supposed to bring? Well, the answer is when you look at the numbers, no, not, not really. So perhaps the administration should have slowed down the building spree, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, instead of doing that, they spun this thing as a very good thing, a selling point for the university, the low faculty to student ratio. All of a sudden, this was now a good thing. And then again, uh, in its filing for uh, insolvency a year ago, they had to sort of change their hearts. And now it turns out that precisely the low enrollment or that low faculty to student ratio was the reason for insolvency. So you're going to have to get your story straight there. But anyways, these are the facts. Let's take a look for a moment at the issue of the Saudi students. So you have here a graph. Um, so the Saudi uh, graph is the, the, bl the light blue one uh, up on top. Uh, this is Laurentian University. So this is uh, students from China and the gray uh, right here is students from India. Now the typical Canadian university has this graph reversed. Typically students from China or India represent the greater proportion of uh, foreign students and uh, students from Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, they're there, but they certainly do not dominate. And I don't need to tell you that uh, foreign students pay, a pro well, at least in Ontario, they pay approximately three times the tuition rate that an Ontario resident pays. So uh, University of Ontario pay close attention to this. So here's what happened. 2018, you see this graph right here go down precipitously, right? The problem is, there, there's two problems. This affected all universities. Perhaps it affected Laurentian in greater proportion, and that was because of the over-reliance on Saudi Arabian students. But if they had only looked at the record, they would have seen that something very similar happened approximately seven or eight years earlier in 2014, when again, for political reasons, the government of Saudi Arabia withdrew its students. Um, and, uh, and this hit particularly some Atlantic universities pretty hard, such as Cape Breton, for example. So there was precedent there. You have an obligation to study, to learn, and to put in place mitigating measures in case there is a repetition or a recurrence of this event. So there was precedent. If only they had looked at the record. Um, let's look at the long-term situation. This is a, a less important factor, but an important factor nevertheless. So we have here, um, the financial statements of the university, so these are publicly available, uh, for the last 10 years or so. And you can see that uh, approximately uh, 11 out of the last 15 years resulted in operating deficits. Uh, the four years that there was a surplus, the surplus surpluses were marginal. And pay some attention to this graph, this is the long-term debt. How is long-term debt defined from an accounting point of view? It's any debt that has a maturity of 366 days or longer. So um, examples of, uh, and, and we'll get into that in a moment, but you see the long-term debt, it's, it's climbing. Uh, they turned it around in 2018 and it came down a little bit. We were at about 90 million or so in 2020. You will see how that jumped uh, in, in 2021, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, this, this is really the one where we need to pay attention because this is what brought the stack of cards down. And that is the short-term situation. So what happened in the short-term situation? Let me define a few accounting terms first. 
So you've got what are called current liabilities versus cash and cash equivalents. Uh, so we'll see a graph of those two uh, in a moment. But what are current liabilities? Those are debts that are coming due in 12 months or less. What are some examples of uh, current liabilities? Accounts payable, uh, taxes owing, um, short-term lines of credit that uh, are coming due, payroll at the end of the month. You got to make that payroll. Um, unearned revenue. In other words, you've taken money in, but you still haven't delivered the goods. Example, when you take money in for tuition in September, but you haven't taught a single class or done a single lab yet. Um, what are cash and cash equivalents? These are, as the name implies, either cash that you have or near equivalent terms. Uh, these are securities. These are defined as securities with a very short maturity days, typically less than 90 days, so that you're not as subject to market fluctuations. A couple of examples, uh, treasury bills, corporate bonds, uh, exchange traded funds, uh, <clears throat> or other high liquidity instruments such as checking, savings accounts. Um, uh, uh, guaranteed investment certificates, short-term lines of credit, et cetera. These are all considered to be near cash equivalents in accounting terms. Okay. These are very important because these are the assets that you will bring to bear in order to service that short-term debt. Think your credit card statement at the end of the month. You've got two choices. You either pay by that deadline or you automatically go into default. Where does the money come from? Well, you gotta have that money ready. You can't have it ready in a year. You have to have it ready at the end of the month or you face default. Same sort of basic idea here. Um, so let's take a look at how these two guys evolved over time. So you've got a graph here of the current liabilities, that means what you owe right now, versus the cash, or cash equivalent in blue that you have right there. Now, you don't need to be a forensic accountant to understand that there was a problem here. Up until, uh, let's call it 2011, 2012, these were tracking more or less in sync. After about 2012, the delta, the spread, the negative spread, that's why I put a negative sign there, between these began to grow monotonically. Uh, to the point where in 2019, 2020, you've got an asynchrony of about $55 million. Now, this is a debt that doesn't wait. This is payroll. You got to pay it at the end of the month. These are short-term lines of, of credit that have a due date. Um, other types of things, contractors that need to pay, be, need to be paid in 60 days, etc. So you better have that money to come along. Well, guess what happened? At some point, the asynchrony was just so great that um, that it led to inevitable insolvency. And at that point, you really have only two options. Either you liquidate the assets, which no one wants, you shut down the university, which we were looking at by the end of February. They weren't going to be able to make payroll last February. Or you ask the courts for protection. So fast forward. This is all going on in 2021. Fast forward nine months. Where are we today? Well, uh, it turns out that the long-term debt, uh, that the total debt, sorry, at that point, once you file for court protection, all debt gets thrown into one basket. There is no long-term, there is no short-term anymore. There's just debt. And basically your debt gets lumped into one category. It's up to $360 million. Um, of this approximately, six, uh, as best I could track it down and reconstruct it, 64 million was, was short term, uh, about 300 million, 295 million was long term. Um, so just one thing that I have not been able to ascertain, and let me see if I can just go back 
Um, in 2020, our long-term debt was of order 90 million or so. In 2021, once court documents start to come out, we learned that somehow that long-term component ballooned to 300 million. That's one thing that once we get out of this mess and we have access to the documents, we'll be asking that question, trying to find out what the heck happened there, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, uh, let me, uh, I guess we got a flicking screen there. So, um, question that everyone asks me all the time, is there anything that could have been done to affect a different outcome, to go in perhaps a slightly different direction than the direction? Yes. In fact, there were two junctures, two specific points in time at which I think the university could, should have acted differently and we would not be here today having this talk. So the first one would have been uh, sometime in late or so summer of 2020, mid to the COVID pandemic, et cetera. Um, when the, when the administration could have come to us at the union said, listen, these are the financials. These are the numbers. You audit them if you want. It would have been immediately or almost immediately clear to the union and everyone involved, uh, not only are the numbers bad, they're trending in the wrong direction such that if you connect the points in the graph, you become insolvent in five or six months. So what would the solution have been in that scenario? And different people ran different models. I did my own modeling. Uh, another colleague of mine uh, did his own modeling. We are pretty much in agreement to within, certainly within an order of magnitude, within 20% or so. The solution there would have been something along the lines of, look, 20% pay cut for the next three years for everyone across the board, faculty, staff, and administration. This would have resulted, some estimates, some, some estimate that, um, <clears throat> so uh, some estimate that you would have needed 25 percent. I'll accept that. I can accept that. My own numbers are more twenty percent. Um, but this would have realized enough savings of about eighteen million dollars per year for the next three years. Do the math. That's fifty-six million dollars to basically conserve most, if not every department, every program and certainly most, if not every faculty and administrative and staff position. Now, no doubt upon hearing this, some would have voluntarily decided, nope, this is not for me. I don't want to take a 20% cut. They would have left, which would only have facilitated the problem. So um, that was the first opportunity. Uh, so that would have been the summer 2020. Fast forward to the end of 2020, December 2020. We've already been through this. Obviously, things the university administration chose not to share this with the union. No one knew about it. No one knew how bad it was. Even though the union kept insisting, we need to see the numbers, show us the numbers, because we were also in the midst of uh, negotiating a new collective agreement. Fast forward, December 2020, we've already been through this. The university goes hat in hand to the government saying, we need a $100 million to bail us out. We went through that, so I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, basically, uh, the government agreed on condition A, B, C. The university rejected it, and as you know, that January, then they filed for insolvency protection. Um, so I'll quickly skip over this, because we've been over it. Let me now focus, now that we've seen a little bit of the legal aspects, a little bit of the financial aspects, let me go to the more human aspects. So what happened to some of the people? Well, I can only speak with certain authority about what happened to my department, physics department. 
Uh, so I'll spend the next maybe three or four slides talking about this. What were we doing in, in physics uh, at the time? So uh, as you know, we, the, the whole department was eliminated, in fact. Um, as the last chair, I was never consulted during the period between February 1st, 2021 and April 12th, 2021, when we were all terminated, basically, I was never consulted by the administration. Okay, we're thinking of shutting down physics, make your best case of why physics should not be shut. Never consulted, never given an opportunity to make a case for why physics should be spared. Uh, I understand that that was the case with uh, other departments as well. So this was not uh, specifically a physics thing. What did we have going in physics? So. Um, uh, we, at the undergraduate level, we had three programs. So what we call a core or conventional physics program, uh, a four-year biomedical physics program, very successful, uh, very popular, and a, a clinical four-year radiation therapy program uh, in which we partner with uh, a place called the Michener Institute in Toronto, which uh, um, specializes in the health sciences. At the graduate level, uh, we had an MSc program with three subspecialties, which you see right there. So uh, very quickly, uh, we were a, by Canadian standards, a small-ish department, uh, eight full-time uh, faculty members. I understand that here you have of order 20 or so, so we were uh, half or a little bit less than half your size. Um, <clears throat> But however, we think that we were right up there on par with any other comparable North American small-ish uh, department. Um, at the time of termination, uh, faculty members in the department held multi-million dollar grants, in particular, those members who were affiliated with Snow Lab and uh, neutrino type particle astrophysics uh, research. Now. One thing that we need to understand is that departments were not targeted, programs were targeted. And basically, to make a short story long, what happened, uh, and this we learned after the fact when I requested a, a special meeting with the, uh, with the union, um, was that a quantitative criteria was used and applied program by program. So remember in physics, we had three programs, uh, four programs, three at the undergraduate level, one at the master's level or one at the graduate level. And this wouldn't be a real physics talk if I didn't have at least one equation in there. So I'll just throw the token equation actually an in inequality. Basically, it came down to uh, a formula, which was something along these lines, the full time equivalent faculty in a program divided by the mean or average enrollment in all the classes of that program. And if this index exceeded a, th a certain threshold, and I forget what the number was, I think it's 0 0.75 or so, it doesn't matter. If it exceeded this number, in other words, if there was too much faculty per enrollment or per student enrolled, then that but uh, specific programs recommended for termination, okay? So um, for a moment there, the radiation therapy program, which was part of the physics department, actually came in under that threshold. And therefore, it was thought that at least maybe one or two medical physics positions could be saved in the department. Well, it turns out not so fast because they divided, they divided this mean enrollment by 50% on account of the fact that it was a joint program between the physics department and the Michener Institute in Toronto. So at that point, all bets were off. That was our last hope, okay? Now, the flaw, of course, in this approach is that you're assuming 
that all faculty members teach in all four programs, the three at the undergraduate level, one at the graduate level, which clearly is not the case. Let me give you an example. Our condensed matter faculty never taught a single course in biomedical physics, nor did they ever teach a single course in the radiation therapy programs. So I attempted to argue this anomaly as forcefully as I could, saying, no, you can't count faculty that don't teach in a program as faculty that are, in fact, teaching in a program, because that simply is not the case. Um, the more reasonable way to do it, I argued, was take our eight, uh, eight full-time faculty, consider that we've got four programs, assign two faculty members to each program, not perfect, but certainly a lot better, and then all four of our programs would have survived. Well, you know where that argument took me, not very far. Um, and so because none of the four programs in physics, in fact, met that threshold, guess what happens? They now declare the physics department redundant, and you're gone, just like that. So um, how are we doing for time? We're, we're good. OK, so um, very quickly, what happened to our eight full-time faculty members, of which seven were tenured? Well, one was retained at, at the university to essentially teach first-year physics in support of other disciplines. Um, the other seven, uh, including your speaker today, were terminated. Um, so where are they now? Our five particle astrophysics specialists, and I'm naming them right there. They have temporary appointments at Snow Lab. Um, our condensed matter uh, theorist, Professor Chitov, who's here today, he is temporarily here at uh, Sherbrooke, and it's through him that I came to give this talk. Um, your speaker is uh, temporarily on assignment with the faculty at McMaster University. And our two technologists, one was rehired by the university, but in a completely different capacity, nothing to do with physics. And our other junior technologist has been picked up by Snow Lab. Uh, very quickly, um, what happened to our students? So we had uh, a total of 72 undergraduate students. Of those three were allowed to stay at the university and were close to finishing less than a year or so. Uh, so they were allowed to stay and finish through wind down agreements. Uh, six of our students uh, switched majors in the university, uh, such as chemistry, math, or whatever. So they stayed, but the vast majority, about 90% of them simply had to leave and look for other programs. Okay. Um, of our MSc students, very quickly, uh, luckily, most of them were almost finished or within a year of finishing, so a deal was worked out between the department and the administration whereby they were allowed to finish their degrees uh, at Laurentian. One uh, was nowhere near finishing, so he had to transfer. Um, I do want to make a special mention of faculty members in the department, such as Professor Chitov, who to this day continue serving uh, in supervising capacities at no compensation to get their students to graduate. So this is uh, a truly extraordinary uh, gesture on their part. Um, is there a path forward for the university? Maybe, I don't know, that's possible. Here's what I would do if I was the university. The first thing is obviously, goes without saying, I'd negotiate the best or the lowest uh, credit or payback that I could. Um, uh, banks, of course, they're probably holding out and stretching this thing as long as they can, because they want to recover as much of their money as they possibly can. Uh, if I was the university, I would seriously think about petitioning the courts to get out of this state of protection, because basically you're not a master of your own destiny. You're at the mercy of the courts, um, which uh, is not a very good thing from a marketing and uh, a a publicity point of view, uh, a PR point of view. Um, you definitely need to uh, get your enrollment back to normal levels because that's where your revenues are coming from. 
the other thing that I argue, which is absolutely necessary in my view and the view of many, is that three individuals, and I will name them, the university president, Robert Haschke, the VP academic, uh, Marie-Jose Berger, and the former VP academic and now secretary of the Senate um, and register, uh, registrar, uh, Serge de Maris, they need to go. In other words, it's very hard to try to install the narrative that it's a new day out, it's a new university, new finances. Uh, now we're into sustainability, but you got the same team running the show. So uh, that's what I would argue has to happen. Uh, you need to address the obvious contradictions. Uh, for example, you decided to keep an engineering program but you have no mathematics or no physics programs or departments. Uh, you've decided that you're going to keep a health science, a school of health sciences, but you've eliminated a very popular program in midwifery, one of only two in the province, uh, radiation therapy, which we ran out of the physics department. Uh, the medical school, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which was jointly operated by Laurentian and Lakehead and Thunder Bay, they have now gone independent. They don't want anything to do with Laurentian anymore. So these are some of the things that will have to be taken care of and sooner rather than later. Um, and it won't be easy. Why won't it be easy? Well, the, the projected enrollment for this coming academic year was down 43% in January. My estimate is that by the time September reaches, we're going to lose or they're going to lose another 20%, meaning that they will initiate the 2022-2023 academic year probably down by 50 to 60% in enrollment. Uh, the costs of re, uh, restructuring, they're starting to add up. So far, about $79 million and counting. I'll have more to say about that. But perhaps most importantly is, is your reputation. If you just open the September 2021 issue of uh, McLean's rankings of the Canadian University, which I think we all agree is probably the more reputable ranking, you see that Laurentian is ranked 49 out of 49. It doesn't get any worse than that. We were never stellar. We were always in the bottom quartile anyways, but at least you always had 10 or 12 universities below you. Now you've got nothing below you. That's not good to attract potential students. Um, <clears throat> and it gets worse. So. Uh, just last month, about a month ago, the university released its financial statement for the 2020 fiscal year. Let me just point out very quickly a few things. Um, so initially, when you read that report, revenues minus expenses, ah, you get a surplus of 13 million. That's good, $13 million surplus. Except there's a line item in there, restructuring costs. Uh, which I alluded to already, $79.1 million. When you throw that in there, it turns out that, well, you end up with a $66 million deficit for the 2020 fiscal year. Okay. Now, remember, the, the 2020 fiscal year ends April the 30th, 2021. Do the math. That only covers three months of CCAA court protection, February, March, and April. And your restructuring costs are $79 million for those three months, and you're already at a deficit of $66 million. Question, what do fiscal 21, fiscal 22, we're, we're in month number 15 of CCAA now. What are these guys going to look like? I don't know, but it, I don't think it's going to look too good. Um, what have we learned? Well, I think I've been alluding to this already, but some of the ideas is it, it can happen again. Uh, it, it, it can happen anywhere. Um, 
administrations now see a short circuit of collective. I don't know if you have a collective agreement here or how it works. I'll assume you do, uh, Professor Tremblay. Administrations can now say, hmm, remember what Laurentian did? Okay. Uh, in the Canadian legal system where we are based on case law and precedent, remember the second time is always a lot easier than the first time. And the third time, it's basically a breeze. So this is new, okay? Uh, banks are gonna have to rethink whether they want to lend to universities anymore based on the previously erroneous but implicit assumption that these loans are backed up by provincial government. Well, ask TD Bank, ask Royal Bank what they think about that now. I'm sure that they'll have an interesting conversation with you, okay? But for guys like you and me, the real lesson here is all of a sudden, after that afternoon, April the 12th, 2021, your tenured faculty job just became slightly less secure. Okay. I think uh, just to sort of end this, um, and this hits closer to home. This is right here, Sherbrooke. You got two private for-profit colleges that availed themselves not exactly of CCAA because they don't meet the $5 million debt standard, but the junior brother of CCAA, which is reserved for corporations that owe less than $5 million, have less than $5 million in debt. But you've got two colleges right here in Sherbrooke that right now are under federal court protection, very similar to what happened to uh, Lorenz. Now, you might tell me, yeah, it's not the same. These are for-profit operations. They're not really universities. They're colleges. Sure, I get it. But it should still be a wake-up call. It's in the same general category of a post-secondary institution availing itself of court protection. Um, I think... So, again, I, I'm going to end it. I think my time is almost up. The three things that I've attempted to do in the last hour, 50 minutes, whatever it was, uh, give you a feel for the legal aspects of it, give you a feel for the financials involved, and perhaps most importantly, tell you something about our own human story and the pain associated with it. So. Uh, I, I really do think this is my last slide, so I want to thank you again for uh, inviting me here, Professor Tremblay, Gennady, all of you, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to try to address some questions or comments that you might make. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a very well-delivered uh, talk, but a very sad story, I can say. So are there any questions? Who, who named the three administrators that you think should be, uh, should, should resign? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see the, the questioner. I, 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 I think he was asking about uh, who should resign uh, no. among the- Who names, the, who named these administrators? Oh, I, I gave three names. I'll be happy to repeat them again. No, who, who appointed them? Who oh, appointed them? oh, oh who, who appointed them? Well, uh, the Board of Governors. Uh, basically, uh, there's a selection committee that is uh, struck. I, I guess this is similar to, to many Ontario universities anyways. So a selection committee composed of members of the Board of Governors uh, and and representatives of faculty, student, uh, etc., is convened, and and then uh, then a a president is selected, and at the end of the day, the board of governors has to approve it. The same sort of thing for the VP academic. Uh, the case of uh, the previous VP academic, uh, Serge de Mers, he was an internal candidate, so it was slight. Thank you for telling us about this. Uh, uh, so you said that still there is some hope that this uh, physics department can be reopened in the future, if I understood correctly, or? This, this, this was done under court protection 
and uh, as part of the CCA uh, legal mechanism, your employer is entitled to legally terminate you and that is irreversible. Now, can the employer at a later time decide that he, he or she wishes to rehire you? Yes, uh, but uh, I, I, I do not think that is going to happen within this generation. So if I understand correctly, the, the, the question is, what can one do as an employee uh, to protect your, your institution? Um, if there's one thing that I, on the employee side, would absolutely insist on, and this is probably where we have to do a little more of mea culpa as employees, uh, or as, as a union that represented the employees is make sure you have an understanding of the financials of your institution. All of this happened because we did not understand the financials. So uh, if, if there's one thing that I can come out of this with and recommend is that you make sure you put in place mechanisms whereby you always have clear and transparent access to, uh, to your financial picture. Okay. If, by the way, if I may, uh, well. There's another question, which is uh, in the chat, which is uh, why did the university refuse the conditions demanded by the government of Ontario? <laughs> That's a, that's a very good question, and we can only conjecture on that until um, all of the documents are made public after uh, these proceedings come to an end. So remember, the Auditor General has the documents, but the, but the general public doesn't, so we don't. I can only speculate, I can only conjecture on what the motives might have been, and uh, there are those, and I tend to subscribe to this point of view, there are those who think that this was actually a provoked crisis rather than an accidental crisis because the administration simply wanted to make those cuts and the collective agreement through the redundancy and exigency clauses built into it would be too slow and too costly. And so therefore, this could very well have been a provoked crisis to short circuit all of that. I think the administration is probably rethinking how much faster and how much more inexpensive or cheaper the alternative was. So um, usually the board of governors is supposed to see that the financial uh, health of the university is good, right? So the Board of Governor didn't do its job. And one hypothesis, which is uh, just an hypothesis, is that sometimes, actually I've known colleagues in, in the United States who told me that. On the Board of Governors, you have contractors that are actually making money with the university and have no interest in stopping them from you know, doing bad investments. Is that a possibility or not? Uh, certainly, certainly the Board of Governors uh, shares uh, quite a bit of responsibility for allowing this thing to drift out of control. So uh, is what Professor Tremblay suggests a possibility that there was sort of a, a nice, comfortable bedfellow status quo kind of thing going on? Of course it's possible, yes. I, I just want to add one comment. Um, uh, Professor Chito uh, mentioned that there seems to be a misunderstanding out there that we as terminated faculty members uh, got our severance payment as stipulated by the collective agreement. Let me, just, uh, let me just put that one to rest. To this day, we have not gotten a single dollar of severance payment. Uh, the expectation is that one of these years, we might get a few pennies on the dollar. So let me put that one to, to rest. So, Tammy, I, I, does that answer your question? I think I formulated it. Uh... Uh, yes, we were thinking exactly the same. Thank you. Any other question from the uh, 
The audience or the chat? Okay, so again, I would like to thank uh, everyone and Professor uh, uh, Eduardo uh, will be there this afternoon. So uh, if anyone wants to meet him, uh, you're welcome. Thanks again. Thank you.